afternoon. My name is Shama Banerjee. I'm the editor at Nimbus 90 and a warm welcome to you joining our webinar series, the 2021 Trend Series this afternoon. This episode is the first in a four part series. Um, we'll be exploring the headline insights that have come out from our Digital Trends Report 2021. That will be launching this afternoon. So do look out for that in your emails. Um, we will be exploring everything from investment to how to support your employees in a changing work environment and how to adjust to evolving consumer behaviors, as well as how to drive recovery strategies in 2021. And that will be what we explore throughout the whole series. In this episode specifically, we are exploring strategy and investment. And I'm delighted to welcome our panelists for today. Um, they are Tom Copinger Symes, who is the Director of Strategy and Military Digitization at the MOD, and Julie Huxley Jones, who is the VP of Research Solutions at GSK. So thank you both for joining us this morning. Good to see you, Shama. Good to see you. Great to see you. So they will both be sharing their thoughts on what 2021 is going to look like for businesses and how to strategically plan for it. Um, but before we kick off the discussion, I would just like to remind everyone that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions or any thoughts or comments you would like to share with the panelists as the discussion goes on, please do just add those into the box at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we'll thread those into the conversation as and when they come through. No need to wait to add those in to the end of the conversation, just add them in when, when they come to you. So to kick off, um, Tom and Julie, I would love to ask both of you to just introduce yourselves and give a bit of background as to um, what you're doing at the moment. So Julie, I'll come to you first. Thanks, Shema. And I'm delighted to be part of the discussion today and look forward to the conversation that we're gonna have. Uh, I'm passionate about ensuring patients get the medicines they need. And I spent my entire career optimizing the R&D process. It's been an absolute mix of scientific, technical and strategic roles across life sciences where I've led strategies and divisions around genetics, computational research, pharmaceutical engineering, automation. And I currently lead all of tech or IT as it used to be known as for GSK's pharma R&D activities. So that's supporting seven sites and 5,000 scientists in hundreds of labs around the world and trying to form a strategy to deliver a technological change that enables all that science to be done digitally. Thank you, Julie. Tom, what about you? Great, so I'm a, I'm a soldier by background and have had a fairly conventional uh, soldiering career for the past 30 years. Um, all the sort of operations that, you know, through Northern Ireland, the Balkans, Iraq, Afghanistan, so on. Um, but I guess for the past 10 years, I've been dabbling in the digital piece, how we fight with digital, how we how we use our data uh, to make us more competitive. And for the past year and a half, I've been in Defence Digital, which is part of strategic command, actually, but but within the Ministry of Defence, um, helping Charlie Forte, our CIO, with his strategy and particularly military digitization. So broadly, how we enrich soldiers, sailors, airmen, civil servants lives with digital in the same way as maybe it is at home, but but isn't always as, as completely in the workplace. Um, we're fairly big. I mean, about two and a half, three billion spend a year um, on digital, which is quite a lot by anybody's um, outside of North America. It's quite a lot, I think. Um, and clearly setting a strategy for that to deliver defenses and strategic commands, strategic aims, but supporting it with digital um, is, is a tough, tough job. But I hold that portfolio for Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. So I'd love to kick off this discussion um, just with a kind of more general question. This episode is about strategy and investment. So what is the primary issue that business leaders must keep in mind when strategizing for 2021 and beyond? Um, Julie, would you like to answer that first? Sure, thanks. Um, I think agility in your strategy. Uh, 2020 has taught us that true north, a, a, a vision statement, a mission, however you want to call it, it's so important to hold on during times of change. The clarity of direction enables you to galvanize your organization or your team with purpose or uncertainty. And that is so important when we're trying to deal with the variety of challenges completely unplanned that, that have come our way. I think 2020 is also a stark reminder of the importance to execute, to execute 
Um, strategic direction with enough agility to respond to a dynamic circumstance. And by I mean that, I mean you need to rapidly pivot to respond to working really remotely whilst enabling labs to run or pivoting some of the tactics within our strategy whilst remaining focused on the goals to deliver. And so agility within whilst a really clear mission and direction both to motivate and pivot, absolutely critical for 2021 and onwards. Mm, I'd like to just pick up on what you said about agility there. One of the big trends that have been coming through our report is that 85% of business leaders have said they've become more agile in responding to consumer needs in the last year. So I think we're really seeing that coming through. Um, Tom, what are your thoughts on that? On that question, what is the primary issue business leaders need to keep in mind? So, I mean, very similar. Um, I mean, there was a great email, wasn't there, early in the first lockdown from a teacher to parents generically across the nation saying, calm down, you are not homeschooling, you're trying to survive. And there are a lot of parallels here. And Julie's point about the North Star, absolutely right. So what we would call selection and maintenance of the aim, you know, remembering what you're here for is really important. But within that, um, within that sort of sense of your overall direction, accepting that, you know, a combination of digital disruption, climate change, the rise of Asia, and now COVID, I mean, just, just four, but I could go on. The compound effects of all those things make strategy writing and delivery very difficult. And, you know, I guess a large organization like us, but probably GSK the same, we used to write strategies for 10 or 15 years. I guess if your strategy is lasting, lasting 10 or 15 months at this stage, that's, that's good going. So I think agility is important. I think keeping absolutely focused on your why is important, but being very, very flexible in, in the how and the what um, as we go through. And of course, trying just to keep your eyes up, to be scanning for whatever's coming next and, and having your sensors out to spot the, the next wave crashing. Is, is going to be really key. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll, we'll drill into those ideas that you've um, mentioned there, both of you in a bit. Um, I'd just like to think about the concept of disruption. So um, more organizations than ever this year have been identifying themselves as disruptors within their industries. We've got 39% of organizations claiming that they are disruptors. So do you think the meaning of disruptor has evolved? How has the pandemic change that tom what are your thoughts so i think it's changed a lot i mean i think a few years ago certainly in in government disruption was seen as a wholly negative word you know i, I remember when you guys kicked off the chief disruptor thing and you know i was talking about it people said well, hold on that's that's like what are you trying to rip us apart or something i said no you know i think to paraphrase trotsky who said something similar about war you know you may not be interested in disruption but disruption is pretty interested in you and I think the, the COVID, amongst other things, has sort of got people into, well, we probably can't beat it, so we better join it mentality. Mm -hmm. And that real sense of this is happening and you can't run from it. So you've got to try and get ahead of it and, and surfing on top of the wave. So I think that's, it's getting much more positive. Um, I think, you know, the ability, I think people have recognised that. Then there's the question, what do you do about it? And clearly in the business world, you can, you know, acquire small edgy companies and help help speed up your transformation. I think for those of us in bigger organizations, some of them can see it. They want to take part in it. They want to disrupt themselves, but they just lack that agility that Julie mentioned to actually do it. And I guess that's the, that's the philosopher's stone we're all after, how you can spot it coming, recognize you've got to change, but actually turn within the cycle. To, to get ahead of it that's that's really tough. Julie what are your thoughts on um, what Tom's just shared there? Sure and I, I really like where Tom's going about um, the pivot of the word disruption itself. Um, I think in addition to it being something other I also historically I think you saw the word disruption being you know really big and rare like the market disruption of a force of change you know if you think of Amazon entering the market or a product like the iPhone it was massive and a big pivotal iconic thing however I think the brace breadth and pace of change disruption is happening now and disruption is being embraced by so many more companies and individuals as something we want to do and this could be making individual improvements to a service or creating a circumstance for thinking completely differently. 
And how do we completely disrupt what we currently do in order to hit the goal we want rather than just making iterative improvements? And even just thinking that way can enable everybody to just be a disruption. And to sort of double click into the, the life sciences industry, just to exemplify it, we've been disrupted over the last decade with new types of treatment. So we're seeing biopharmaceuticals, cell and gene therapies, commoditization of capabilities and super contract research organizations, embracing of innovation with biotechs and significantly more business development and academic liaison. The finally, the rise of AI ML and modeling and during COVID completely changing cultural views on the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry. Sort of the rise and recognition of the societal value that we provide. And so from my end, my whole world in the last decade has been completely disrupted. And Tom's right, you know, strategy has to be very agile and, very, you know, quite dynamic at the moment. So disruption is now up for everybody. It's about a mindset to make iterative disruption, incremental disruption as well as big disruption. And I think if you're open dis to disruption, you think differently about how bold and creative your strategy can be. I mean, and again, if, you, if I could just exemplify that, when I think about the industry I'm in, the voice of the patient's getting completely stronger in our industry, rightly so. And digital is part of that journey. I mean, everybody has some kind of wearable device that's continually monitoring their health and status. And, and I can see, you know, how many steps I've not made this morning and how bad my heart rate currently is. And so in my industry, wellness and healthcare prevention are now going to be the first wave of treatment. And an informed medicine, taking a medicine augmented by new applications and new devices, means that they're in a much more empowered sense of when they want to take a medicine and the smart medicine being the future of what we want to do. So as a consequence, if you prevent or ignore disruption, you know, we're going to have another Kodak moment and you'll be out of the market quite quickly. And you have to really embrace it at the strategic, at the major level, but also really embed the willingness to be disruptive at every individual in your culture by creating an environment which says, Disruption is okay at every level of the organization. And that means you can have an agile strategy. But if you have any um, fault point in the permission to be disruptive within an organization, that completely limits your agility and your ability to deliver on strategy. So your questions are really interesting. They're sort of hand in hand. You have to have an agile strategy. You've got to have the willingness to be disruptive at every part of your team to make that happen. But Tom, I don't know if you, if, if, if that, I'm seeing you smile. My, there's no, a resonance. I mean, it, 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 it resonates absolutely. I mean, I think the, the bit that I point to for people is, is these compound effects of lots of disruptions happening. And, you know, I remember from my sort of physics A level, you know, you had those sine curves and they can either overlap and the disruption gets bigger or in a weird way they can cancel each other out. And I think that's why I said putting your sensors out, you know, trying to spot the next things coming, just seeing you know, quant is going to help us with this, of course. And if you're not doing your quant analysis, you know, you're probably being lazy. But quant is only going to take us so far because some of the sort of perturbations and combinations, you know, we're still in sixth sense territory, frankly. And, you know, intuition ain't dead yet. You know, all of the, all of the data we've got is really important. But reading it is going to need a lot of intuition, intuition and a lot of guts. You know, we're going to have to make some calls and our instinct is going to be, go find me more data. Let's study the problem a bit more. Let's fall in love with the problem a bit more. And we just got to know not how we just plunge in and find a solution to a problem we don't understand yet. But when you've done enough analysis and you've just got to make a decision and, and go with it, knowing that decision will not be perfect. And I mean, hey, COVID is probably a great example of that. You know, we've all felt sympathetic, I think, for those people making decisions where there is no perfect decision. Mm -hmm. But the wrong decision is waiting till tomorrow. You've got to get with it and try and get ahead of the curve. So I think we're, we're absolutely resonating. Um, yeah. Definitely. So we've just had a question come through, which I'd quite like to ask now, actually, because I think it's, it's very relevant. Um, this is from David. He's asking, what impact does the increasing need to be advanced have on the traditional approach to enterprise scale IT design and implementation? Um, Tom, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that. Well, I guess um, 
I guess architecture is a word that didn't mean much to a lot of people three or four or five years ago outside the IT business or outside those who build, build buildings. But I think increasingly people are recognizing unless you, you understand your processes, you know, at that, that enterprise level. And that the job of enterprise architecture um, is not really with CIOs or CDIOs or, or, or the technologists. It's with the, it's with the business. You know, it's with the organization to understand how they want to run themselves. And only once you've got, and you know, architecture can be, uh, it can put people off. You know, I just think of it as an operating model. Um, so you've got to get the leadership being very clear how they want to run their business or their organization so that the technical architectures, the data, um, the information architectures can be sit, set underneath that. So I think that's the big lesson. It's this getting the, the IT folk closer to the, to the business. Uh, mm -hmm. and getting that much more rapid interaction. And no longer is the sort of CDIO just summoned to the board and told, go fix it. There needs to be a much more interactive discussion. Okay, so what are we fixing? What are we trying to do here? And then how do we enable that um, change in operating model? So I think that's the, the major point I'd point to, but that's probably because I'm not a technologist. I think at that sort of enterprise architecture level and how we try to operate, and in our case, operate and fight, uh, how do we want to run the business, and therefore, how does the um, how does the technology support that? Mm. Julie, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, um, I actually, I'm resonating quite similarly, even from a technologist's point of view. I think the waterfall is dead, uh, so I think the first lesson around being agile and responsive is actually don't fight it, really embrace agile. And the trick is to make sure that if you are an IT organization or tech organization, your partner is going to be agile too, because otherwise you're trapped um, in a waterfall process. I think the second one is an, is an absolute uh, alignment with where Tom was, which is about understanding what the business change really is. Uh, or the ability to deliver any business now without uh, tech or IT being absolutely at the centre of how that business is run is 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 long gone, and every decision is now being data augmented, whatever industry you're in. So rather than positioning enterprise IT design implementation as very much other or enterprise IT, really it's about making sure that that technology strategy is absolutely part of the business strategy you're trying to achieve what is the business trying to do and the tech is part of that it's the work stream within rather than a parallel strategy and the dynamism that in, in the question that David raised about being agile and responsive I think it's about having a really clear path of where you want to get to and really owning your technology there being the expert not the parent child deliverer of tech but really being the expert in the room saying this is what's possible this is what we can do and then once those bounds are there it provides the opportunity to say where can you do the puts and takes whilst not distracting from the long-term ambition so you have to be thoughtful with the agility and responsiveness you have to be boundful with it so that you don't distract from your where you're trying to get to and you have to absolutely have to come with a clarity of mission and that mission is not an IT or tech mission that mission is the business mission that you're working in and really wrapping it together and I think you get that you can be responsive because you're doing it together mm. hopefully we address David's question <laughs> I think so. I'd like to just focus it on continuing this discussion around, you know, disruptive technology and being agile. Um, one insight that came out this year was a focus on cloud. Um, so cloud has increasingly become more perceived as disruptive in comparison to how it's been perceived in previous years. We always have machine learning, artificial intelligence topping the disruptive technology scale. This year, cloud has really come into its own. So I wanted to ask you both what do you think has driven that? Why has our perception of cloud and its disruptive potential changed in the pandemic year? Tom, I'll come to you first on that. Well, look, I think it's it's that enabling of agility. So the ability to, to run a little experiment in the cloud and then either scale it if it works very, very quickly, you know, that elasticity that we're all after, or to fail it and move on to the next experiment. You know, that's you know, down at the fairly tech level. 
that's really important. Now, to, to Julie's point, that if you're, if you're trying to do that as the IT bit of the business and the rest of the business isn't on that mindset, then you're in a really difficult relationship. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I guess that's why, you know, I mean, it was happening anyway, exponentially so, but, but it's absolutely come of its time now. Um, and I think we're just moving. I think we're just moving from sort of mainstream leaders having heard this word cloud and kind of the, the conversation was CIO, go get me a cloud. And, and the answer was fine. What do you, what do you want to do with your cloud? And we're just breaking into that conversation now of, of, of why it's important. And that's, again, that's where the change goes exponential. So I think it's a maturing of both the technology, the availability, the understanding, and that interactive discussion between, you know, CIOs, CDIOs, and the, and the board. Um, I mean, it's not really, con- sorry, I'll, I'll finish soon. It's not really connected to the, to the cloud, but, but one of you, uh, Julie's earlier comments really struck me, you know, one of the key enablers to agility is having the CIO on the board, not reporting to the chief risk officer or the, some, somebody else, but, but having it on the board there so that there is no delay between the board having a view on something and then the technology supporting um, that decision. And, and likewise, cloud is getting there because I think more CIOs are on the board and, you know, cloud doesn't travel well over Chinese whispers. It just confuses the hell out of people. And you really need people who understand it speaking directly to the business so that they start to understand what cloud can offer. And that's where I think we are generally. Sorry to go on so long. Not at all. Julie, what were your thoughts on that? Oh, you, you teed it up beautifully, Tom. Um, I think cloud offers the ability to change a technological operating model. And I think 2020 showed and exposed the potential because of the need to be remote working, the need for speed, the need for addressing latency. So it, it, it more it exposed the opportunity than necessarily changed its ability, cloud's ability to be disruptive. Mm. And I think, you know, the operating model gets you into some really interesting questions. Like it enables you to ask, do you really need your data warehouses? What facilities do do you actually need? Um, and again, that was exposed when when a lot of uh, businesses started working remotely, including GSK. A lot of our scientists and our, our engineers are working remotely. However, uh, two things to think about. One is multi cloud. I think the smart the smart money at the moment is on multi cloud or hybrid cloud, whichever we want, word you want to call it, and 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 making sure that there's again agility and flexibility in your strategy. I think as well, uh, this past year particularly has also seen uh, the realization of data sovereignty issues, not necessarily triggered by the pandemic, but perhaps exposed by a more politically charged ecosystem around the world. And data sovereignty asks then questions on when, where and how could you use the cloud? So on one hand, we're seeing across the industry a rise of adoption of cloud for an operating model and a cost-based perspective. On the other hand, as you start to do more AI ML, more meta high performance computing, you may be working with data which has sovereignty restrictions, you may have to see concomitantly a rise in high performance computing. And certainly looking at, you know, the the Apple and, and and Nvidia's big bets over the last couple of years, you know, there's uh, there's there's we're not dead yet in the water for on-prem computing either. It's definitely going to be a multi-cloud, multi-prem hybrid environment for the next few years in most big industries. So I think we've discussed that from a from a high strategy level, talking about getting the CIO on board, everything else. We've got a question here, which is focusing on the workforce. So this is from Martin. He asks, how do you get the workforce to understand and appreciate the value of new technology, particularly when they are quite rightly focused on their current tasks? So I guess this is the flip side of what we've just been discussing. Um, Julie, what are your thoughts on that? Um, So I guess I, I can sit in a place of privilege that my partners are scientists who are inherently, as I am, curious people who want to try and get something done. So, um, So even though they're curious and technology obsessed people, uh, generally, it's all about talking about the why. Why are we here? What's that mission? What are you trying to achieve? So not to get circular, but that really that starting point about that strategy and that the technology is part of achieving that strategy. 
So working on a day-to-day basis with our business partners to say, what is it that you're trying to achieve? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Not having a conversation about technology, but having a conversation about what the business problem actually is. What's the quickest and most efficient way to solve that business problem? Or concomitantly, where do you need a longer play because you need to invest in building up data reuse capability or data acquisition? And if you start there, when you start with leaning to where the problem is and how you want to solve it, the technology becomes a natural conclusion. Um, a great mentor of mine, John Baldoni, used to say, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is at. He's obsessed with hockey. Um, and, and that's the thing with technology. You need to skate to the problem that you're trying to solve and the answer you're trying to get. Because actually the way of getting there and the technology might not even exist yet. And you've got to take somebody on that journey and test their risk appetite to see how bold they want to be to solve the problem and how willing that they are to solve the problem. So skate to where that person is, but recognize that every industry needs digital and technology now. There is no escape from it. And actually what's amazing about the next generation of talent entering the workforce is they don't see it as being a separation. It's just just part of life. So own that in your conversation too but hopefully that's brought it to life from at least my privileged perspective of working with scientists and technologists every day Tom what are your thoughts on that on that question yeah so look it's a it's a huge bit but it's it's the right time to inject people into this because that you know that's the, the key to all of this the cloud is easy the, the, the people is the, the tough bit um, so reflections I mean I always think of this broadly in three layers you know the senior leadership the middle and the, the young insurgents, I, I think of them up below now. And of course, I'm going to generalize. You know, I think most people joining our organizations now, at, if you're a bottom fed organization, are much more intuitively aligned with, you know, what some of Julie and I have been talking about because they've been living it. You know, they've, they've never known a, a world where there wasn't a smartphone. They've never cashed a check at a bank, et cetera. So um, there they really, they're very thirsty for the tools to, to just get on with it. Um, senior leadership, you know, because they're smart and because they wouldn't have got there unless they were smart, are, are in the right place, but often feel um, disempowered just because they, they don't have time in busy lives to really upskill themselves. Um, so finding time for, for them to, to empower themselves. I know that's a strange thing to say about the, the sort of C-suite or the board or whatever, but finding themselves the time to understand the tech, but critically how to lead in a digital age is difficult. I and mean, we've just kicked off a fantastic program for literally the whole senior leadership of events, you know, the four stars and the three stars to come together once every few weeks to, to do exactly this. And it's, mm-hmm. it's awesome. You know, it's awesome as a program and it's an awesome um, well, dare I say, it, humility from them to, to engage with that. You know, I don't think often boards uh, do education programs together. Um, and then, of course, you have the middle, which is everybody's challenge with the workforce. And, you know, this is scary stuff. They're, they're focused on their job, what they've been doing for the last 15 or 20 years. They're very familiar with how to do it. And some of them, as Julie points to, have forgotten the why. So getting them focused back on the problem, the outcome, you know, what we're actually all doing to try and find space to say, okay, so if that's the outcome, is that process you've been doing for 15 years, is that still the most relevant way to get that outcome? And if it's not, why don't we break down the problem again? Let's, let's really look at the outcome and let's, let's see if we can reassemble that um, and focus on how, in this case, technology can help us get there. But, you know, make no mistake, that is deeply searing emotional business because people get very familiar with the processes that, you know, they've got them through 15 or 20 years of their career and get them to deconstruct that and reconstruct it again. You know, that's, that's tough stuff. That's really mm. tough stuff, especially when you're not even in the same room as them and you're trying to do it over a tube like this. That's, that's hard. So I think we've, we've kind of dissected this from the, from the people side, from the perceptions of disruption side. We have a question here from um, Ian, and he's asking, do you think the commercial procurement approach has kept pace with and can take advantage of the changes that disruptive technology can bring? So to bring another angle to this debate, um, Tom, you're laughing. Please do yeah, give me your thoughts. No, I mean, look, if, if any large organisation out there is saying, yeah, we've, we've smashed it, you know, we're absolutely up with the chase, then please let me know who they are because I'd love to go and sit down with them. 
Um, some are better than others. Uh, we're on our own journey in the, in the public sector. Uh, we're very focused on it. You know, there's a um, uh, defense and national security industrial strategy being published. Uh, I can't, can't remember when, but sometime this year, you know, we're trying all sorts of transformation in our acquisition process and so on. But this is, this is hard. And just to qualify Julie's bit, I mean, waterfall is still there for, for large amounts of our business. You know, we are still producing big platforms that take decades to design and build. And waterfalls probably still has a, a role there. But equally, you know, we're trying to focus the soft on the software that sort of animates those hardware platforms rather than the sort of, um, I don't know, the top Trump's qualities that I used to focus on a kid, you know, how big they were or their tonnage or how many weapons it had, whatever. Um, so in that flip from sort of hardware to software, from, from platforms to, to systems and systems of systems, um, you probably need at least two different modes, I'd say, of commercial you know, that you've got a waterfall and you've got an agile or whatever you want to call it. And trying to gear them together um, is, is just plain tough. It's just plain tough. And getting the workforce across the business to gear those things together with you and change their ways of thinking um, is tough. It, it's, very, it's very tough, but we're, we're on it. But um, anybody who thinks they've cracked it, good luck. Julie, do you have a response on that? Sure, uh, and I, I think I think you you teed up really nicely. I think there is always a practicality. You know, there isn't a limitless pot of money to buy every technology you want, and um, the answer is not necessarily to homegrown make your own version of everything either. But I think it's about having a conversation about risk in your portfolio. Um, how much risk do you want to take? How many bets do you want to take? So where are you going to um, target fast moving, rapid acquisition? You may pay more to be first or an early adopter. And where are you going to counterbalance that with commoditized capabilities? So if we're talking in the tech world, buying off the shelf solutions, trying not to customize them as much as possible. The more you customize, the more you carry upgrade costs for every time that that, that platform is upgraded, <laughs> particularly if you're doing it in an agile way, every, you know, you're getting a version every couple of weeks. So it's about having that balance and where you can offset to enable uh, faster risk taking and being really clear on what is competitive in your part of the business working in partnership with your procurement organization to say this is where it's really competitive this is where we will take a risk this is where we want to be the first price of course is always important but this is where we're willing to be a little bit more flexible and concomitantly here is absolutely where we will drive down and get the energies and efficiencies i think if you can have that mature conversation around procurement you find your procurement partners are absolutely enlightened because just like we've talked about <clears throat> how tech and digital needs to be part of the business strategy. Procurement is another critical business function that also needs part of that journey and to understand the strategy in order for them to do a flawless job. Mm -hmm. I think we've, we've got a question that's just come in, Julie, I think is um, aimed at you, um, asking, is the ABC process agile enough to keep pace with the disruptive advances in IT and CIS? Do we risk being outpaced by adversaries and do scrutineers understand the impact of their decisions in this space? Ooh. I think that was, I think, I think. <laughs> that was actually oh, for you. Oh, I think that's Sorry. Fair, yeah. so, so, you can have the first step and I'll follow up. <laughs> so the ABC process is our annual budgetary cycle. Um, uh, well, it's annual, so it should be pretty agile. Um, much, much of our commentary, you know, in previous years has been it's too annualized and that leads to too many changes of direction. Um, is it, is it perfect? I, I would guess not. Um, is anybody's annual budgetary cycle, whatever they call it, perfect? I'm, I'm going to guess, guess not. But I think it does have the agility and, you know, we, we've just, we're going through a, 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 an integrated review and comprehensive spending review year, um, which happens every sort of four or five years. So you get that longer term view and, you know, the government went noisy with a lot of this um, just before Christmas of, of, you know, how we see this playing out. But there'll be more later in the year, as I understand. Um, uh, and then every year we get to refresh it. Um, I guess, like any organization, we need to make sure that as we refresh that thinking, that budgetary cycle every year, that we're working on data that doesn't take us 
months to collect and then we find out that you know we'd put rubbish in and you're getting rubbish out um data that we can get much more at the push of a button i mean that might seem like a distant dream for for many people but to to, to julie's point about other functions you know digital commercial people hr you know all the functions working together on the horizontal if you like across a business i think if we can if we can work together and feed off each other you know what what hr are doing helps us in digital what digital is doing helps people in logistics what digital is doing might help people in commercial and vice versa as we get stronger together on the horizontal we can make those processes you know that any large organization you know so defense uses abc but any large organization has a has a similar thing and we can make them much more slick much more agile and we can allow our leaders to make much better decisions informed by much richer data um, and that intuition I spoke about, you know, that's not going out of business anytime soon, but that we can move, move faster and stay within, you know, what Julie called that North Star, you know, that, that head mark of strategy, but veer and haul and adjust, to, adjust dynamically because we've got those processes in place. So sorry, a long answer. It's a, it's a, it's a complex one. Um, and I wouldn't for a moment to pretend it's perfect, but I think it's good enough for, for getting on with, provided we keep, keep improving. And actually, you know, for all our differences in company, we have we have an ABC too. So that's why I initially actually thought it was for me. Uh, so it's a, uh, world of GSK, we love acronyms as well. Um, I think one of the key uh, builds from my perspective, I'm fully in agreement with everything that you've said, Tom, is I think also the purpose of the product approach in tech. And I think having a product strategy and a life cycle approach to every product that you're working on helps you overcome and work with an annual budget cycle because no company is going to go away from that no matter how agile we think and actually no matter even the most agilely branded modern big tech organizations have an annual budget cycle they just might not shout about it as much it's always there because it's how companies work um i also think that it, it also speaks to how in delivering products, we need to think about uh, disposability. So historically, we've bought, we've built systems to last decades, and some of our systems absolutely still do. Others, three years down the road, we probably need something wildly different. And the, certainly, in the pace of science, the capabilities that that I was working on five years ago are really very rarely fit for purpose in five years in the future. So thinking about the at what point do, would you dispose of the solution you're building that you know think of an iphone everyone upgrades every three years probably right so think think of the disposability and put that into your product life cycle planning and put that into the financial that helps you work with procurement better it helps you work with hr better because it's a capability you need people to rapidly learn and then drop as they're receptive for the next one, but it gives you perhaps a different frame to approach an annual budget cycle rather than a thing to be feared, but a thing to be embraced. Mm. Thanks, Julie. So I think I'd like to just zoom out and look forward ahead to the kind of to the year ahead and just beyond for now. Um, so when we asked the respondents of our survey about their business goals, looking forward, they were more immediately focused on productivity and profit. And then looking ahead, we saw an, um, more investment in employee skills, developing new products. And then even further afield, we saw a focus on sustainability 18 months from now. So what do you think of those, those initiatives, that, that prioritization? Do you think some of those need to be shifted around? Tom, I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly on the sustainability piece as well. Yeah, so I mean, I just on people, you know, you've got to be you've got to be investing in your people now that's the, your existing workforce your existing talent but also it's a you know clearly it's good time to be recruiting uh now now i'm i'm the public sector so i did the profit thing you know <laughs> a lot of you out there will say yeah well that's all right for you you don't you don't have to make a profit um so very easy to say you've got to focus on your people uh but but you know to me it's all about your talent pipeline at the moment and retaining the the talent you've got and, and getting you new in um, on sustainability. I mean, I've been astonished just how quickly this has shot up the agenda. And again, maybe 18 months, but I reckon now, I mean, we've, we've just produced our first um, sort of sustainable sub strategy to, the, to our main digital strategy. Um, and a lot of people are like, what are you, you know, 
hey, what are you doing this for? Um, and then literally a week later, the same person saying, I get it now. You know, I've learned a new word and now I'm seeing it repeated everywhere. So I think the sustainability issue, you know, the, the fifth industrial revolution, if you want to call it that, um, you know, clearly Julie and I are talking mainly about the fourth industrial revolution and digital, um, which I think of as a sort of supply revolution. You know, there are new tools and therefore it's driving new behaviors. I see sustainability as a, as a demand revolution where, you know, suddenly we have to behave differently. Suddenly we have to work differently. And of course, I spoke about compound effects. The fascinating thing is how those industrial revolutions are going to compound on each other. How digital is both a, a spur for um, more sustainable approaches, but is also the answer to so many of those sustainable approaches. So I think that's going to be a fascinating one to track. And uh, of course, you've got 18 months if you want, but I, I think we've got to be dealing with sustainability this year, um, at least getting our heads around it and trying to understand what it means for our, our different organisations. Yeah. Mm. Julie, you seem to be in agreement with a lot of what Tom said there. Yeah, absolutely. Nodding violently. I, I, I absolutely understand why the next six months I and mean, productivity equals profit, right? So productivity, whether in public sector or, or, or private sector, it's all about getting back on your feet again. I totally understand that. But it, I agree with Tom, it's short term to delay the focus on investing on skills. And actually, um, sustainability is so important to the the trust of an entity and the societal value that we place on that entity that team that department that company that sector so if we want to both develop and as tom said retain talent we have to think about the societal values that that talent pool has so not only should you move from doing no harm to doing good across every sector in terms of sustainability it's also a magnet for you to be able to legitimately retain people as well. So those that are bolder are thinking here sooner and they're th seeing it as a theme to catalyze new products, catalyze new skills and, and also use it as another motivator, another North Star if a company is evolving its current mission is, well, we'll deliver this, but we'll deliver it in a more sustainable way. And, and, and I think that could be that could be where you see the make or break of companies, sectors, entities. Those who stay on the short term might have a swifter recovery if they've had a delay over the last year, but have they really got the long-term capability plans built in where sustainability is part of that? And those who are playing the longer term game may have a slightly slower recovery, but will thrive faster. Mm -hmm. So Shamir, if I, if I could just add, I mean, one, one comment from in lane and then one comment dangerously from out lane, but, but it's worth, worth sharing. I mean, clearly the sort of whole build back better agenda is, is really important to Julie's last point there, you know, doing it well, maybe taking a bit more time of it, but doing it well is, is going to give us long-term resilience and, and, and stretch. And the other thing, my, my, uh, my missus is, is just sort of interviewing for Ned roles and so on. And just her doing her research on them, the way ESG is ripping apart the finance sector at the moment, and that absolute focus uh, and the range of tools of, of looking at what people are doing about their governance, their, their social uh, responsibility and, and, and the environment is, you know, whilst I don't have to worry about going to the markets for money, anybody who is, you know, ESG is just a massive factor now. And the way I see it, a lot of investment calls, they're going to overlay your ESG template on you and then judge you on the back of that. So I think, you know, whether that's a push or pull factor, I don't know, but I think it's coming to every company near near, near you. And um, yeah, there, there's not much time to, to hang around about it. Mm. So I'm, I'm dangerously off piece there, but, but I think I know enough about <laughs> it to, to notice how much of a change is coming. Definitely. And I think we have one more minute. So I'd just like to quickly squeeze in one last question, which is in response to what both of you have been saying there from Edward Bearcroft, he asked, it's interesting that for all the short-term disruption trends, many resulted from long-term mission-oriented thinking. Um, the COVID vaccine platforms resulted from a DARPA mission, which drove the mRNA research and development more than 10 years ago. Um, the pandemic made us capitalize on this long-term work. So how do we balance the need for long-term missions, but react with short-term reality as it emerges? So I think that really is the crux of our conversation. So Julie, do you like to go first? Yeah, it's, it, 
Edward's absolutely right. Um, and it, it, it it's about going back to the original point, really being prepared to be bold in where you're trying to get to. And then courageous with being agile to pivot within that. So, for example, the, the example that Ed, Ed, Edward, where Edward brought up, you know, there were pivots along the way across the industry with SARS and vaccines development there, with development in core research around mRNA research, um, continued vaccine technology development as new products were being supported that had nothing to do with COVID and an accumulation to pivot and leverage all of those different technologies quickly and implement them with purpose in the last year. And I think that's where the, it's a very difficult balance and it's a great question because it is a challenging thing to do. But looking at where can you be clear on where you're trying to get to and then be absolutely relentless with your agility to pivot continually throughout the way and being humble enough to say, where are you going to build that yourself and where are you going to buy it in because it's not or where someone else has got a better idea and you can accelerate your delivery by smart shopping. So it's it's a, it's absolutely the, the crux to a good strategy, Edward. And the trick is to, to, to just make sure that you have that balance embedded in everything that you do and everything that you plan for. And I'd, I'd just say amen, amen to that. I mean, we're back to strategy making, having a long term view, but being dynamic. I mean, our partnership in Defence Digital with DSTL, our Defence Science Technology Laboratories, is getting closer and closer because it has to be. And I'm minded the way the question was said about that old one, you know, how did you go bankrupt? Well, real slow and then real quick. And again, how did you, how do you produce a vaccine? Real slow and then real quick because those foundations have been laid and because you had smart people, good processes. And when the load came on, you could go exponentially faster. And that's what we're all trying to do with our, with our organizations, aren't we? But, but it comes from that strategic underpinning of being really clear about your why and then having dynamic processes in to be able to speed up or change within that overall purpose. So I guess we're back to where we started. Definitely. Well, that is where we sadly have to finish. Um, we are out of time. But Julie and Tom, thank you so much for your contributions to the discussion. It's been it's been really great to hear your thoughts. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you.